And we've basically been in this industry for almost 19 plus years at this point. Gatekeeping back in 2016 was insane. There was just no one sharing anything. A little like, oh, you're right. Maybe they don't want to see me. Maybe I'm I'm not, I don't belong. We said, you know what? There's a lot of lash artists out there right now doing lashes who feel like they're doing it wrong. Like they're being told, no, no, no. You have to do exactly the way I do it or you're evil. But really, if you want to be a successful business person, you got to be doing both. You got to be a great lash artist and you got to be a great business manager. Oil is not the evil that everyone says it is. Like I said earlier, we don't believe in the lash damage. I've uh, probably just pissed off a whole bunch of people. Sorry. <laughs> but that's about it. Robots are coming. It will not be the end of the lash artist. It's just going to be another option. <laughs>
I'm not in the film industry anymore because I really wasn't that successful there. And truth is, my wife, she fell last, like I said, back in 2005. She went into it. She got a salon going, hired staff in the middle of the Great Recession and grew her salon when things were bad. So for people out there worried about, oh, the economy's down, oh, things are tough. Stop worrying. You can actually still grow and thrive even in a down economy because beauty is something women will always do. They don't. They, they do not give up their beauty choices. Vacations, expensive purses, trips in big homes and big dinners. But beauty, no, that's untouchable. So you'll you'll do fine. Uh, but that said, uh, for me, I, I basically saw the success she had, how it was growing in 2000. I, mean, I was always helping her doing stuff in the back end. But 2011, we had someone steal $5,000 from us on our staff. And at that point, she said, you know what, I need Paul. I, said, I need someone I can trust to be managing the back end of the company and really being there to help me. So she asked me to step away from my career and um, basically help her run the business side of things. And I had never run really a business much. I had done a couple small businesses, but ne never really to that were a large scale. So I said, sure. And, and I basically had to learn business at, you know, 2011. It was like going back to school. And basically helped her run the salon. We did a horrible job for a few years. And then finally, we kind of found some good systems. We hired a company called Strategies, which really taught us how to run a salon best. And they're an amazing company. We don't get paid for them, but I love them. I always promote them. And we basically transformed our business, made it profitable. And um, yeah, and then we did that till 2019. And then in 2018, I started thinking we should move to podcasting and really pivoting, really kind of following a little bit of Gary Vee, the, word, the idea is that you need to create an audience, right? If you want to sell the audience, you need to create an audience and give them value. So we said, well, let's do a podcast. Let's start doing more on Instagram. Let's start sharing tips. Let's start helping bless others without any expectation to make any money. Like just say, look, just give, give, give. And that's what we did in 2018. And then we started our conference in 2019 with the same goal of really changing the conference world where a lot of people were going to conferences that day and just getting pitched ideas like, hey, buy my training, buy this, buy that. And I said, no, we're going to do a conference where you come and every talk is about giving you value so that you actually can be uh, walk away with actual tangible things you can do to change your life and do better in business. So LastCon started that in 2019 and basically caught it. <laughs> And we had closed our slot just before that, and we moved, pivoted fully online. And since then, we've been doing LashCon. We did lots of online classes, and we've been doing going around the country training and so forth. So that's really our new kind of shift. And we're just basically, basically an online business for the most part now, other than we get together once a year for the biggest Lash party in the, in the world uh, here in Los Angeles when we do uh, LashCon. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Um, I love it. I didn't think I would. I found out that basically building a business is just as much fun as making a movie. Um, and then plus, you get it's about being around people. And I'm a people person. I love helping people and serving people. And so nothing makes me happier than doing that. So it, for me, while it's not the dream job I thought I wanted when I was younger, it is definitely become the dream job that I've always wanted because I get to do so many fun things. I get to do podcasts, make videos, which, you know, a little filmmaker in me gets to do that and then i get to we get to speak at a lot of conferences and i when i was young i wanted to be a good one i wanted to be a stand-up comedian when i was younger so i was like oh here i get to at least practice some of my really bad routines in front of people and reaffirm <laughs> yes you're not a stand-up comedian but at least you can get on a stage and speak once in a while which is a lot of fun really is a high for me so yeah that's a little bit of my background and how i got here and why i'm here now okay nice cool and uh, can I ask you something? I hope you won't get offended or take this the wrong way. I'm sure maybe you get this question <laughs> all the time. How does it Probably. feel? <laughs> how does it feel to be like a man in the beauty industry? Oh, how how do well, people respond to you? But no, no, I don't know in the beginning. Uh, well, I don't are you this. like uh sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and I was um I just got into it and Instagram was going. My staff would harass me because I'd show up and I would start doing posts and do, put me in. And the staff would go, Paul, no one wants to see your ugly face. I mean, they love me, but they're like, you know, we need to get like cute young women on your on here from the salon. No offense, but you're at those days, I was in my 40s. And they're like, yeah, that's probably not going to sell a lot of people in the salon world. So I actually kind of got a little self-conscious about it. I felt a little like, oh, you're right. Maybe they don't want to see me. Maybe I'm I'm not, I don't belong. But then I, I started hanging, going to conferences and trade shows that were not last related. And I saw a lot of men 
at these hair shows and these beauty shows and beauty uh, conferences for business for in the hair, hair world. And I really, these guys have no problem. They totally belong. They, they, in fact, I, I was amazed how many amazing hairstylists are men. Cause I always thought, yeah, you know, when yeah. I grew up, I got my hair cut by women. Um, I didn't expect to see some of the top hairstylists in the world are all men, you know, like Ted Gibson and stuff like that. So I was like, Oh, I guess men are welcome in the beauty industry. So I started changing my opinions and that's really when uh, like 2017, 2018, I said, no, I told Tuss, we should do a podcast. And you know, what? I'm, I'm really the business side. She's the, all the, really the creative side. She does all the lashes and she see, you know, she's the one that comes up with all the technique. And we kind of felt like we had two buckets that really worked well where she could talk about lashes and that. And I can talk about the business side. Cause that's what my focus had been for the last seven, eight years before we started podcast to learn and read every book, watch podcasts, go to classes, so it, it just felt like natural. And now it's kind of fun. I feel like I'm a unicorn. In fact, I remember one of my coaches back in 2013, because I remember telling her, I've, it's like, I was going to help with the front desk. And because we had the cup pull back because we we're redoing our whole company. So to save money, I was going to work front desk instead of just doing the managing. And I remember my she, her saying, oh, this is great. I'm like, why is it great? I'm a guy, dude, some old dude working front desk. I never saw that in my, my 40s. I'd be doing that. That feels like failure. So no, 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 no. It's a, it's kind of different. It's unique. When you're going to walk in, women are going to walk in and go, oh my gosh, there's a, not, not some young 20 year old, but there's a dude behind the front desk working. That's kind of cool. It's kind of a, um, it makes it a little more special. You do a little more unique. If you, if you spin it right, it's actually kind of fun. And, and in fact, I, I would, people would ask, I mean, sometimes a client would come in and go into the room with my wife or another staff member and they go, Oh, how sad. There's like a 40 year old man running, working front desk. That's really sad. I, I hope he's okay. Did, did something go wrong in his life that he ended up working here, making minimum wage at front desk. And then they was actually, no, that's, that's the husband of the, of the owner. So it's okay. <laughs> so um, I, I begin to learn that it's a unique position I'm in. It makes me at least stand out a little bit, maybe not always for the best reasons, but it does make me stand out and I've learned to appreciate it and embrace it. And things have gone well for us. So it's not been a detriment. And I do have my other lash bros. We call them, you know, or we have Jamie. Lash from bros. Lash. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we have That's bros. a thing. Yeah. We're going to start a club and we'll have a little pin that we wear saying lash bro. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> You're actually our first male guest. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On the podcast. And um, speaking of podcasts, of sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. And and speaking of podcasts, um, yeah, we, we won't be the last, hopefully. Uh, we definitely <laughs> love to have more guys on here. Um, but there's not that many male lash techs. Mm -hmm. Very, very few. But um, yeah. anyways, yeah, going back to my question, um, I mean, we can discuss that uh, in another yeah. uh, section, but um, what made you want to start a podcast, your own podcast, The Lashcast? Yeah, Lashcast really came out of the need to want to, well, a couple of things. One, gatekeeping back in 2016 was insane. There was just no one sharing anything. You go around, you ask people. I mean, people, I remember the days where Lash Arts would call our salon and try to book an appointment. And then afterwards, they would start asking us questions like, hey, what glue do you guys use? Like clients never ask us what glue we use. We're like, oh, you're a lash artist. Wait, we tell them, we use this glue. We use lash bomb or whatever. And they'd be like, oh, well, thank you. And then they wouldn't book, right? <laughs> so people were trying to get information from other people, but the, the last gods in those days, the, the influencers were all about, you don't share anything. If you want something, you gotta pay for my training and I'll share you everything. So we really didn't like that. We went to some conferences, the same thing. You go to conferences and everyone would be gatekeeping. They wouldn't really share everything. They just kind of give you a peek into their knowledge. And we thought, wow, this is really not good for the industry. Plus, Tusty doesn't do lashes the way other people do. Um, lashes are, you know, lashes are, again, like I said, it's not a moral dilemma. It's really a pre matter of preference and style and technique and how you want to do them. And we were told by multiple people Oh, Tuscany, you do lashes bad. You you do poorly. But then I look and go, wait, we have a salon that does a million dollars in business. I have 13 lash artists working. They're booked out for two months. They all do Tuscany's technique. No one complains about our technique and it doesn't kill anyone. Why are we doing it wrong? Yes, we do things differently, but we're not doing it wrong. That's different. And so in the industry, we said, you know what? There's a lot of lash artists out there right now doing lashes who feel like they're doing it wrong. Like they're being told, no, no, no. You have to do exactly the way I do it or you're evil. <laughs> it's really like, no, calm down, calm down, right? 
No one's evil. No one's a bad person because they don't do lashes like you. You have your preference. We have our preference. So we said between the gatekeeping and the last God's shaming, I'll call it, we said we would like to open up the dialogue and talk about what other, you know, let other people draw outside the lines. Be, you know, say, no, right, we don't have to be drawing like a like coloring between and the numbers, right? If you want to scribble everywhere and do it on right on the walls. Go for it. We're going to let you do it. If you want to use lashes in ways that people say you shouldn't, we don't care. Do it. We are going to, we're going to, and then we're going to look into what's, where are the limits really? Like we don't believe there's a, and everyone talks about this, lash damage doesn't exist. I, for years, have asked, show me permanent lash damage. I want to see pictures of permanent lash damage and no one has ever sent me a photo. And I've sent, asked on a podcast, I've asked on Instagram, people will show me a bad set of lashes that look really gross. But that's not permanent lash damage. Lashes, when you cut them, when you do them, they grow back. We've talked to doctors, countless doctors, some of the leading doctors in their fields about this issue, and all of them said, you know what, There's really, we've never really seen it. It doesn't exist. It's just one of these myths that get perpetuated. So we like to, and in fact, another one that we were, back in 2006, Tusney was wetting lashes after appointments. Like when someone got done the point, she would rinse the lashes and stuff like that. Back in those days, you were considered like the worst lash artist in the world if you did it, but we had actually... Doing that, you uh, looks like my camera just went off. So back to yeah. So the idea was uh, so yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, wedding, la wedding lashes was a evil. Right now, everyone's like, oh, you should rinse people's lashes. You should clean the lashes. It's not going to cause a premature fallout. But back in 2006, we were told we were horrible, horrible lash artists and all that. So. That's really was all that type of stuff. We said, okay, there's a lot of myths. There's a lot of misinformation. A lot of people are just taking assumptions versus actually talking to experts. Like we've talked to chemists, we talked to doctors, we talked to um, one of the leading uh, allergists in the country who deals with contact dermatitis that talks about lash allergies. We, we've done a lot of research. And plus over the, you know, what, almost 19 years, we probably figured we've done 60, 70,000 sets of lashes between our staff and us. So we have a large sample size to say we've tested all these things like 60,000 times to find best practices. So with all that, with the background, we said, you know what, we need to do a way to get this word out. Instagram, you know, again, me being a guy, maybe isn't going to really click as fast and people are going to get as excited about our page, but podcasting, no one really was doing it. And I was a big podcast listener. So I said, why don't we just do a podcast for lashes and help people with both business and lashing? And we can share all our ideas. It'll be our own platform. No one's going to tell us to shut up. Maybe people might not like us, but at least if they do, they'll just turn us off and stop listening. But those who do, the ones who see the same things or feel, or feel empowered will attract. And now we've had well over 2 million um, downloads of our podcasts over the last five years. And we're basically doing almost a million a year now. And uh, it's been a blessing. It's really been something special that we've um, really grown to love we do we generally try to do two episodes a week we're hoping maybe to get three maybe this coming year and really find ways to just educate and help people meet and we, and by the way we don't just also interview the top like the most pipe famous or fa um most influential lash artists we we have, we interview just everyday lash artists like everyone else so the little little guys like us yeah. Yeah, or no, you know, LLB is not a little guy, but that said, you no, know, we just, we are we are actually uh, we are actually very small compared to to your your platform and your podcast. So we're right. actually like so grateful and thankful that you even agreed to like have us, <laughs> oh, not have us too. to come to us, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> electronically no. for our podcast. So thank Definitely. you so much. Yeah, you bet. No, we're excited to be here. So that said, that's kind of why we started it. And um, it's just kind of grown and it's gotten more and more fun. We've had lulls where it wasn't, you know, it was work, but we're back in the point now where I look forward to sitting and talking to people like you about our business and about what can help lash artists so that they can grow and feel fulfilled and build a business that they're proud of. Awesome. And let's talk a bit more about lash con. So you did touch on it briefly. Can yeah. you um, maybe expand upon um, uh, why you wanted to start lash con? You did mention it briefly um, yeah. because I know you mentioned you have some very unconventional um, uh, opinions and, and ideas about lashing, which we will get. We will get. That's a whole separate topic that we can get into. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about lash con. How yeah, did you get started con, in that? Yeah, I mean, last con again started similar reasons as our podcast back in 2018. Man, no one was talking about business. You go to last conferences, all they talk about was technique, technique, technique. And we were like, 
And as salon owners, we had come to understand and realize, man, the number one problem I think most salon owners or most lash owners are facing is they have no idea how to do business. They don't know how to market. They don't know how to grow a team. They don't know how to build systems. They don't know anything. They, they spent all their time and training watching videos and learning about lashing better. But really, if you want to be a successful business person, you got to be doing both. You got to be a great lash artist and you got to be a great business manager. Because if you, don't, if you can be a great lash artist but can't market, then no one's going to know you exist, right? You're going to be working and doing one client a day because no one knows you exist because you don't know how to get your message out. And if you don't know how to do systems, then you'll never, you'll be working double hard and making half the money because you, you, you don't know how to set up systems to help make your business run better. And if you want to hire, forget it. If you don't do any training and want to hire, it'll be a disaster. You're, you're, you almost every salon owner I've ever met has makes zero money off their salons or they, or they definitely make less. I shouldn't say zero. They make less than their staff. That's a standard practice. The idea of being different really has always been something we've always have been proud of because it really helped us sell our brand even as a salon or now as a conference, even as a, as, as a podcast, just being different is a selling thing. Not to be weird, but it, if, if you have legitimate reasons to be different, you should go for it and double down on that. And so that's why we started it. We wanted to be a different conference. And also we wanted to have new voices. Back in the day, you know, if you went to a conference between 2012 and 2016, 17, it was all the same people. You just saw the same people. God bless them. Great people. But they all just kind of circulated the same speakers. And I was like, no, I want to have a conference where we see new voices, where we see different voices, uh, diversity, all that. Can you kind of briefly um, explain your kind of un unconventional approach to lashing, maybe more in depth, as you say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I'm personally not a lash artist. Tessany, I've had lashes put on me, but I feel like after 19 you years- You had lashes yourself? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I had lashes. Yeah, I've done it. I, I, I wanted to see what it felt like. Now, Tessany wants me, <laughs> and I might do it soon, wants to teach me how to do lashes. Just not that it's to be on clients. Just so I can say, I, I know what the pain's like. I know the struggle. So I, I have thought about doing that, and that may be coming sometime soon. It'll be a fun thing. We'll probably shoot on YouTube. Oh, wow. Anyway, I'll just tell you a few of them. We have a lot of things. We have a whole thing called Lash Myths Busted where we go through and share a lot of detail. So one of the things that we do, and probably the number one thing that Tusney does that is a big benefit that gives her the best retention, I feel like, in the industry, but at the same time, a lot of people look at it and go, no, that's how you do it. She, for classic and also for even, she doesn't do volume, she'll do pre-mades because why make fans when you got them already done. The pre-mades today are wonderful. They're not the crappy quality like five years, six years ago. So she used pre-mades. She bonds the whole, as much of the extension to the hair, to the hair itself. So normally when someone, I'll just use my really bad graphics here. Normally you have your hair and you take a little lash with a little dab of glue and you just pop it on and you just drop it. Like we like drop and, drop and forget. It's like we, we call it. So, or drop and hope. That's right. We call it drop and hope. We go, I'm going to get near and I'm going to just drop it and hope it stays on. And then they move to the next one and they drop and hope again and they drop and hope again. And lashes, if you brush them and all that, you know, this is why most clients go two or three weeks max because too many lashes fall off or break off after a while. Well, Tusney saw this years ago, back in 2005, 2006. She's like, I want them to last longer. So she started coating the lash with the glue with the, from the extension and then attaching the whole lash. When it was classic, it was just one hair to one lash like this. And what was great about that is it, it would, once it got on there, it went twist and turn, it wouldn't break off. And she also would go all the way down to the base. She wouldn't glue it to the skin, but she'd do it right next to the base, which everyone's like, no, 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 you need to do it two, wow. three, four millimeters off the lid, which pisses off a lot of people when we, they see what she does. But we always ask <laughs> why, and they go, well, that's why. Well, because someone told me it, I should. Or they go, oh, well, why? Because it causes more allergic reactions. And I'm like, so why do you still have allergic reactions since you now have it four millimeters or two off? Do you still have allergic reactions? I go, yeah. I'm like, then what's the difference? You're still getting an allergic reaction. And we've talked to doctors and they even say, look, anywhere, if the if basically if the cyanide lets anywhere near the eyelid, it doesn't have to be touching the eyelid, the allergic reaction can happen. So it's not the fact that it's touching the skin that causes the allergic reaction. The fact that it's near the body is what causes the allergic reactions. So we realize it's safe to do that. And when you go closer to the skin, it gives you better retention, better mechanical fit, and it doesn't, it doesn't look grown out. 
Problem if you put it off a few millimeters off the lid after a week or so, it's, or it's even further off the lid and you can notice yeah. that. You put it right next to the lid, that first week it's just barely grown off. It just gives you longer lives. So Tuscan clients on average go four weeks. All our clients go like, we have some that go three. We have one or two that are like two weeks so they don't want one lash ever missing. But 90% of our clients go four weeks between appointments. And then when we had staff, the same thing. All of our staff members had their clients go four weeks. It's because we did the much what we call a better bond. We call it the integrity bond because that's what Tuscany's, our business, our company was called. So we, we really attach. And with the same thing is true when you have a pre-made. So you take a pre-made and you would basically attach one side of the pre-made on. And then if you want to, you can put it on the other side of the lash and put another pre-made on and you can make a, a six, eight, 12, 16 D fan, putting two pre-mades, but attaching one full side on. So that type of stuff got frowned upon. Like I said, back in the early days, um, people didn't like our opinions on water. Now, thankfully, they've come around because people now realize that Sinorac actually bonds with water. Um, so it's not a problem. Oil is another one now that a lot of people say, oh, don't get oil near your lashes. And we are like totally like, it doesn't matter if you get oil. We've actually done tests where we- um, Really? Oil, yeah, oil has no impact oh, on wow. the Um, I mean, we talked to a good friend of ours, a chemist. It says technically it does, but if you do lashes the way Tusney does, when Tusney you bond does. Whole lash, you don't have to worry about oil. Now, if you do a really weak bond where you just put a minimum glue and you just dab it and you just drop it down, yes, oil can be a little bit harmful. But if you do a stronger bond, use a little bit more glue, he, he's a said, no, nah, then glue, the glue will not get disintegrated by that. In fact, we did a test where we painted one eye with oil, uh, I forget which oil we use. And then the other one had nothing. Tustin applied lashes on both and we tracked it and we filmed it for three weeks. And this, they had the same loss on both sides. There was no difference. Like this side lost more and like that. Um, we've mm -hmm. actually seen videos where people will attach the, the 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 extension to the hair and then pour oil all over it, rub their hand and it stays on. Like it, it doesn't matter because actually oil uh, acts as a catalyst for cyanuracolic glue. So, and this is why people like um, forensics use this cyanuracolic and oil actually, when they use um, cyanuracolic, when they were looking for dusting for prints, it's oil that connects and actually from the oil from the body, that's what fingerprints leave. It connects with the cyanuracolic and that's how they find uh, fingerprints and stuff. So oil is not the evil that everyone says it is. Um, like I said earlier, we don't believe in lash damage. Um, lashes grow out and every three months you've lost all your lashes and new lashes have grown in. So even if you do something that breaks one or hurts it or something like that, cuts it or burns it off by fire, by accident, don't worry, it's going to grow back. And, and, and I know a lot of people worry about weight, like, oh, too much weight. It's going to weigh it down, cause a follicle to shrink. We've talked to multiple um, dermatologists as well as ophthalmologists about this. Uh, oph ophthalmologists, actually not ophthalmologists, whatever that is. Um, and again, they're like, no, that it would take... What will your body has a natural um, system that reacts when something damaging is happening? It actually gets raised and red. So this has happened, I'm sure, to some people where they get their lashes done and two lashes get glued together and they start to pull on because one's growing and one isn't or at different speeds. And then all of a sudden you get a little red bump on your eye, and that is when lash damage is actually happening. But the problem is. Most people never get to that point. As soon as it gets irritating, they start scratching it or they call their lash arts or, or they pop it out. They just pull it out. They go, no, I can't stand it. I'll just pull it out. And that actually doesn't do the lash damage they think. That actually does no damage. If you just pull out your lashes, it'll be fine. I know people are comparing their brows. Oh, I used to tweeze in the brows in the 90s and everyone lost their brows. Brows are not the same kind of hair as your lashes. I've asked, we asked that question. And then the dermatologists have told us, no, 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 it's different lash type of hair, not the same problem. Um, there's a condition where someone, I forget what it's called, Tusk would know, but it's um, where the lashes grows out and goes into your eyeball. And, um, and often people say, well, the way you treat that is just keep pulling that lash out because it's actually one of the leading causes for blindness in developing countries. And uh, basically the idea is that's not the best practice. You don't just keep pulling the lash out because it will not, that lash will continue to grow back and continue to go into the eye. They have to ablate it. They have to burn it out. That's really the only way they're going to stop that lash from growing. So pulling lashes, being too heavy is not going to be a problem. I mean, if you got to the point where they're so heavy and they're, and they're raised and basically inflamed and, and all that, yes, that's not good. But I've never seen anyone do that. It's too irritating. It's too painful. No one's going to go to that point. So that's why we don't worry about weights. We don't worry. All these people come with all these diameters and all these plans. Like your body has a natural system that will tell you if the lashes are too heavy, which it never is. But if it was, your body would tell you it'd be painful. Your eyes would be sore and you'd be like, oh my gosh, these are too heavy. 
So that's why we don't believe in that. I've uh, probably just pissed off a whole bunch of people. Sorry. <laughs> but that's, we we do think about these things and we do talk to people and we do test these things. We don't just do it. Or there's a lot of things that I call it causation versus correlation. There's a idea where people have tracked the release of Nicolas Cage movies and they found out when Nicolas Cage removes the move, a movie that comes out, more children drown in swimming pools. So the natural you know, causation there is say, well, I guess people must be dying in swimming pools because of Nick Cage movies or children are, which is ridiculous, right? That's what that is really called. That's called correlation. You're just seeing two trends that happen to match each other. So yeah, Nick Cage movie, more children drown. Not caused by it, just happens to be at the same time. And a lot of people, when they make, um, uh, I guess, correlations in our lash industry, they'll see something happen. They go, oh, I'll, I know what happened. Their lashes fell out. So, and I heard they use oil the night before. So it must have been the oil. It, it's not the actual cause. There's no connection there, but it is definitely they're correlating going. Those two things must go together hand in hand. So, I mean, I, I've said this sometimes as a joke, like it'd be like me if um, I, you know, I noticed that someone had a hot dog and the day before, and then their lashes all fell or prematurely. And then I make the correlation. Like, mm -hmm. I guess it's hot dogs. People must stop eating hot dogs before the lash appointment because when they do, all their lashes fall out. And that's the type of connections that we see often made or industry that are incorrect. We lovingly say that's incorrect, but that's okay. We're learning, we're living, and we're going to figure this all out. That's why we have podcasts. That's why we have discussions. That's why, why we're not about shutting people down, saying, don't talk about, hey, you have an idea, share that idea. Talk about let people bounce around. Don't don't get mad at people if they differ an opinion. And we can eventually we'll find the truth. I mean, it, it will. Always, I think the truth will eventually always win. It just sometimes takes a while to get there. So I am. There's wow, a few. Well I said. I, <laughs> I know. I wish actually we had more time. We are gonna be running out of time very soon because we are using the free version of Zoom. Ah. So I do want to ask you two yeah. more very important questions. Um, yeah. First, uh, where do you see the lash industry with uh, moving towards in the next uh, 10 to 15 years? Um, I, what I'm calling it right now, I'm calling it the great collapse. Um, the industry is changing a lot because um, people are burning out in the industry. A lot of the big salons, a lot of the big companies, uh, not big, um, big lash companies uh, are, you know, after COVID started trying to diversify, find more money. We had a lot of people jump into the industry because they basically got COVID money and bought product and I think we're going to sadly see a bunch of companies closing. Um, the industry is not infinite. Um, I think there's enough lashes for everyone to make money. But at the same time, I don't think we have if we can have like 10 million lash brands. I can't have every lash artist have their own lash brand and make the type of money that they wish they would make. They make some money, but they may have to change their expectations or they may have to go back to school and learn really how to market and business that. So I think we're going to see a little bit of con uh, constriction. We're going to see companies, and we're already seeing it. There are already a bunch of brands that I know of who have either pulled back, changed their way they do things. Um, CEOs have stepped down. There's been a lot of change in the last year. And I think that's going to continue for the next couple of years. But that said, I don't think the last industry is going to continue, is going to shrink. It's, if anything, it's going to expand and grow more and more people. I think men will continue to uh, look into it and get more into it. I don't think it's something that's limited and we've hit our ceiling. No, we've definitely hit our ceiling. There's plenty of growth and there's plenty of opportunity for lash artists. So if you want to be and you want to be a lash artist, that's awesome. I think you can be a lash artist for 20, 30 years. It's just like being like a hairstylist. It's not this ceiling like, oh, I, I can be a lash artist for two years. Then I have to have a brand. Then I have to be a trainer. Then I have to be an influencer. Then I have to be this. It's okay to be a lash artist for your whole career and have an amazing career and make good money. You can make $100,000, $150,000 a year just doing lashes as a lash artist and become the best at your trade and become really good at marketing and selling your services. So you don't have to be um, something else to make good money. You can make a great career just doing lashes. So I, I always want to say that because I feel like a lot of people feel like bad that they haven't like moved on. They've been doing it for a year or two and they're like, oh, I'm not yet famous or instant famous or I'm not a trainer. Or I'm not uh, being a brand ambassador. It's like, it's okay. It's okay. There's plenty of room to be just a lash artist, which is not really just, it's an awesome opportunity to be a lash artist. So yeah, I think we'll continue to see it grow. I think the robotics are here. We, we've actually consulted for a company called Loom. They are, they right now doing their first trials really with a slot. They're working out of an Ulta down in San Jose in the Bay area of all places, Silicon Valley, which is where I grew up and they are doing well. It's going well. And I think the robot robots are coming. It will not be the end of the lash artist. It's just going to be another option. They're going to be doing lashes like in 30 minutes and they can't do really high-end lashes that most lash artists do. They're going to open the door to the 
our person just wants that quick 20, 30 minute appointment and just wants to get in and out, which they won't pay for lashes anyways, because they take too long. So this will open the door and bring those people in, which will bring more clients, which by the way, I think once they get in and they get hooked, they'll start thinking about trying maybe a longer appointment, see what it looks like. And they'll go, oh my gosh, you know what? It is worth an hour and a half appointment to get their lashes done versus the 20 or 30 minute appointment that this company is doing. So I think robots are here. They will be in full, I think <laughs> in the next two, three years, they will be full. We'll fully be the robots. <laughs> yeah, we, but oh, by the way, the robots are run by lash artists, just so you know. So that good news is <laughs> right. if you don't like lashing 24 seven, you just want to lash at the beginning at the end because that's what they do. The robot doesn't do it all. The person sets them up, cleans them, then the robot does it, and then they come and fix things. That could be another option. You get to be a tech, get to run a machine, and you don't have to be bent over for you know six, eight hours a day doing lashes, just maybe for an hour a day and get paid the same. So that's another option too. So yeah, that's some of the things I see coming. True enough. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm really so sorry we're running out of time. No and I really wish we could continue this conversation. Maybe we can schedule like a part two, because I would love to talk to you more. Um, yeah. But thank you so much. You've had some like really great information, very scandalous. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> flash police are coming to get you after this podcast. Yeah, but I'm going to be arrested here in a second. This. Yeah, I'll be dragged away. Everybody watching this podcast should save it while they can before <laughs> Paul gets locked up but yeah, thank you so it. much and um we have less than a minute so I want to thank you again and we really yeah. appreciate you taking the time to um be a guest on our podcast and we definitely want to continue this relationship in the future so we will have all of your links if you want to listen to Paul's podcast follow him on Instagram follow his work that him and his wife do they offer a lot of you know business advice coaching tips tricks all of that you can learn more about her techniques and thank you so much, Paul, again. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching this episode of Glam Gossip by LLBA Podcast. Hopefully it's not the last to come. There will be a part two in the future, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I'll be back. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.